Uh, we will be starting with a little bit of overview of the, the team itself, a little bit of the active projects to the Graphic Pro AFI. Uh, we will be switching out into demos, the Java uh, demos. But we'll quickly, quite quickly through those, uh, just because we've got some good time. We only have one mic in this today. Um, and then at the end, we will have half an hour with uh, OpenID Connect uh, and that integration that how, how that works with TCS2. Um, and we specifically, we're going to use the key for that at the demo. As I said, I, I'm Morten, Morten Hansen. So there are multiple Mortens in, in our team. So I just, uh, I'm the Morten H guy. Um, we also have Morten Jolly. He's uh, working out of Ireland. He's kind of the product lead and the technical lead. Uh, we have a full-time engineer called Claude. He's also um, started, just working for us about uh, almost a year now. And we have Shacha working with his and but also with us for part-time uh, supporting the project. So I'm just going to jump into it. Um, so lately we've been kind of switching stacks a bit. We've been trying, to the years we've been trying many things from Python to Node.js and different things. And we kind of settled now, I think on a good, good stack that seems to be working well for us. Um, it's, at, at this core, it's Java, what we've been using for a long time. This is also what the core project is, is based on. Uh, on top of that, we're using Spring Boot, which should hopefully be familiar with you too if you have been using uh, Java already. And we're using Apache Camel as an integration framework itself, which is uh, based on you know this kind of enterprise integration patterns where you can do all kind of flow, flow code control and so on. And, and, and it has a bunch of components for HTTP and, and all other things that which you will see very recently. Um, we are also using for not all of our projects, but some of our complex projects we use something called data sonnet. Uh, it's a nice little language for doing JSON to JSON transformations. Um, and Actually, I'm queue, uh, which is just basically a, a queuing system where you can put stuff on the on your queue and you can pull it out using another script. I mean, but again, we're going to see a demo of that uh, later on. Uh, we have been building our own stuff um, on top of this. So we have a Java SDK that we've been working on. Uh, still early, early days, but, but it's, it's, it's kind of good enough to be, to be used. Uh, and on top of that, we have built our own camel components, which, which again, you will see how, how it works basically. Um, we also use kind of hot, hot, hot IO for the monitoring, but Shacha will show you that later and we will see how that works. And, and there's a bunch of testing stuff also, which I will not get into today, but we have examples of that in our repositories. Uh, but it's basically the main stack. You will see this the standardized stuff also in, in uh, HS2 core. And uh, the only kind of, and maybe the difference is that we're actually using some of these published show metadata packages as part of our integration pipeline. Yeah. As I said, we have a, a simple Java SDK. Um, kind of the, the main thing it provides is basically a client to talk to these as two, which takes off you know, kind of your authentication protocol. We might be using API tokens, what's called the, the PATS now, or personal access tokens, or it might be using just basic all. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we will build on that and support other protocols also. But right now, those are the things we support. Uh, we also generate a full uh, model. So for every version of this 2 we are actually generating the full model uh, in, in, in for, yeah, well, for every version basically. So you have, I would say, close approximation to the DHS2 model. It's not the one-to-one. Um, there are certain things that require for this one are not 100% there yet, um, but this will get better over time. So at some point you will kind of be able to say, say give it organization units. And it's not going to be the organization unit from DHS2, but it's going to be one that has a lot of utility methods around it that kind of helps you um, to communicate with users to basically without having to create your own tasks again and again and again. Although I will be doing that in some of these demos. Uh, the link is there. Um, so you can please feel free, feel free to, to start trying it out. Give, me, give us PRs if you have any bugs and, 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 and yeah, generally just, just talk to us if you have any issues with it. Maybe the more interesting thing when it comes to the integration is that um, based on the Java SDK, we also built out the camel component, uh, these are two specific camel component. Again, it kind of takes away some of this kind of tedious work with talking to DCS2, posting some stuff to DCS2, get going back and forth, back and forth, and all the kind of things, and then kind of a nicer model, a nicer abstraction. Um, 
Again, I will show you demo this soon, but you will see that you can do your simple stuff that give me all the organized on DHS2. Again, you can point to the item type, is, so you point it to the full task name. Uh, in this case, it's version 228.1. Um, and the path you want to, and then the fields you want. So, you know, this typical field filtering stuff you're doing in DHS2. Um, yeah. So, I have some demos, but is there any questions before I, I, I jump on to the demo time? If not, I will just continue. Okay. Small, that's fine. So the first stuff we're gonna show you. Closer. I mean, the uh, I think it's better. I think you can move this one. Yeah, I think so. so yeah. Oh, this, yeah. 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 Is it clear? Or is it? Oh. <laughs> uh, so, guys, we're just reorganizing a bit internally. <laughs> Make it bigger. I can, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not about to focus now. Right. So again, I, I, I will have to be a bit quick here. Um, it's a pretty much a standardized um, Spring Boot application. So you will recognize the Spring application run and so on. Uh, what is new here is that we are building two clients. Again, this is using the, the Java SDK. Um, we have set up. Um, again, all these examples will be online later. I just so that's why I'm going to be a little bit quick, but you could go through these examples later and you can have a look. We are basically setting up our own uh, application for as well. Um, where we are pointing to uh, the instances. We want in this case we want to synchronize some organets. So so we have a master um, or, or or a base or, or, a, or a starting point, and then we have a target. So uh, we could probably have multiple targets here, but in this case, we have a uh, replication between two instances. So whenever something is added to demo one, it will be also added to demo two. It's a, it's a simple, straightforward example, but something that's a very typical use case and a very typical integration case, right? You want to, there might be data elements, there might be category options, there might be option sets, there might be something else, but you want to synchronize what you're doing uh, between multiple um, instances. So again, using this application file, we are now building two clients. We're taking all the properties um, and we're building two clients. So, and it's also those as two as spring beans. So we have one called this as client target, one to this as two client uh, source, right? Nothing too crazy there, I hope. And again, please stop me if you want to need more information during. So, so just please, please ask. It is two clients. So that's part of the Java SDK. So the DHS2 client is part of the Java SDK. That's have to be. No, we are, we are just depending on the Java SDK. 
So the Java SDK is here as we have a, is as a dependency. Yeah, okay. Um, we see it somewhere. Uh, okay. Here we see we are, we actually we are linking to the the, the kernel component, which is also driving in the Java SDK itself. So the the the, the research plan in this case is not something I'm creating here in my project. That's something that's been pulled in as part of the of the um, of the SDK. Okay, so that's been So it's basically created now. We have two clients, pre configured. One, it knows it's going to this source, which is a demo one. The target knows, okay, my, 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 my connection is with demo two. So the first, first, first route we're going to do, so it's a little bit. A bit of a code here, but don't worry, it's pretty straightforward. Um, oh, something else? Okay. It's a bit of delay also, so. Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. So we're setting up a timer basically, and, and this, here again, this is up to you how often you want to do this every night, or you want to do this, in this case, every 10 seconds. Um, but Um, that, that's all this really means. It's just a fixed rate of every 10 seconds it will to run this route that we're going to talk about. Um, then this is just the name of the route itself. So whenever you see something in the log, it will be called read organics. It's something, because by default, it will be called something you know, generated like route one or something. Uh, so this is just to name it. Um, and then again, we'll just skip this right now, but you will see here. This is what we're doing, uh, what we're trying to do. We are trying to get all the organets from the source. Um, and we are also setting some pair parameters to that request. So I'm not going to go through the, to all the details, but as you probably know in this we have this parent uh, hierarchy. So you usually want to order by level. So it means that you're always going to get level one first and level two, level three, and so on. So you don't get this missing uh, parent pointer kind of reference issue. Uh, in this case, we do all of them, um, which is depending on what you want to do, depending on how many organics, it might not be a good idea, it might be a bad idea. We are also not doing any last up the filtering. This just again, it's a simple example. Um, we are just going down to level two. So uh, in this case, we, only, we have only one level, but you know, if you, you might have a very deep tree, we might not want to uh, synchronize all levels. So I'm just going to select that. And then we are, these are the fields we are interested in. Right? So there might be many more, there might be different, you might want to have translations and so on. And in this case, we do get simple, just for the typical, the code, the name, short name, description, opening date, and the parent, which can be applied. Parameters to, to make it work at all. Um, in this this particular case, we are not using this uh, generated um, generated um, classes. So we are we are instead using just a simple Lombok wrapper. I can zoom in. So again, this is just to show that you can use whatever you want. We don't have to use the, the provided domain classes. This is an, a very, very straightforward example. I know exactly what I want. And in this case, it's very, very simple. So I just created a very simple Lombok class, which just helps you. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. So, so you basically, this is Java, right? So it's not, not dynamic. So you just want, you want to target into your class, basically, the target class. Um, and in this, like, in this case, you just get the view exactly what you need and nothing else. Uh, but again, that's kind of up to you. You can use our own classes, you cannot. Depends on the version you're targeting and so on. Um, but in this case, uh, we are not. Can I go back to the previous um, yeah. yeah. That's the last point that I like, says, like, to JMS observer. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that last. Get that. Yeah, 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 I'll get that. Yeah. So uh, the point is, so coming from here, from this two line, you basically got to end up with a, with a string of bytes, right? A byte string, basically. Uh, just, just a bunch of um, in text. So what do we do with that? Well, use, this is actually using Jackson behind the scene, but you will unmarshal that, that code into JSON. Well, 
from JSON into this or this uh, wrapper class. And now you have um, an organization units class with all the organization units present in that, that class. And now to make it simple for ourselves, instead of, you know, potentially this could be 10,000 organites, 1,000 organites. So we're doing a simple split. Uh, and the split you can basically think of as a for loop. So we are not taking um, these organization units, they're using what's called a, a simple pattern. They're basically um, we're extracting just the organites. And, and that's a list. And now all this list are going to get me looped to one by one by one by one. And in this case, we are doing nothing at all with it because we are, our target is also DHS2. So you don't need to transform it much. You just kind of just uh, repackage it back into, into the JSON. And in this case, again, this is managed doing that. I decided to start up um, an Artemis. So this is an internal queue that's been started up with your Spring Boot application. Um, so now it's all it's doing is putting it on this topic. So one on one organites that we have will be put on this topic. And that's it. That's all that's happening right now. But we also have the receiving side. It's a bit of the list. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> very lucky. Um, again, in, on the receiving side now, and remember this, this could have been two separate instances, two different servers or whatever, right? So this is why we're kind of splitting it up. Um, if you have all of this in the same server, you might not always want to use this, although it can give you some robustness, especially if you're going to be handling that topic with a lot of things, it might take some time to process one by one. So it, it does make sense. Uh, so here on the receiving side, remember we were just sending JSON, so it's basically a plain text string. So, okay, so what you do now, again, we want to name the route because it just makes it a bit nicer. We again unmarshal it, but remember now, not to the organization units, but we're receiving one and one organization unit. So we're just directly getting a full organic. Um, we're doing a little bit of processing. Um, again, this is just to make it easier for ourselves and just to show. Um, Instead of using the API organization unit endpoint in this case, I'm using the metadata endpoint. And I'm also, it's hard to see. I just want to show you that I'm actually using uh, the classes from our, sorry, there's a bit, it's a bit, uh, okay. okay. So uh, I, it's actually using the classes from our SDK in this case. So the receiving side is using the classes from the SDK. I just want to show you that how that works. And so in the, in the sending side, it is using a simple number uh, process. And the receiving side now they're using from the SDK. Uh, and we're wrapping it in a metadata um, wrapper. As you probably know, that's just how you, whenever you send to the API metadata endpoint, you have to wrap it in uh, the metadata uh, and, uh, wrapper, basically. You just have a list of organization lists. Again, all of this stuff you see here, set organization units, all of that stuff is auto-generated for you by the SDK. So that's something that's just available to you. And after we're doing this little processing, this could also be done using a converter and many ways of doing this. And this is just a simple way of doing it. We again just setting, kind of updating the body of the message. So Camel knows what is, what is currently processing. And if you see here, this is the last one. We are posting. We have the verb here post hang out to the path metadata, the body, to the user itself, and the client, of course, in this case, is the client target. Remember, before you had the client source, this is the client target. So this is demo two. And we will show you quickly how that actually works, but this is demo two. So, any questions for that before I will actually show you the demo? Again, all the code will be available. Uh, it's currently in the private repository, but it will be made public um, yeah, maybe tonight or something. Uh, and it's linked from the slides. Yeah, I guess. And you're using uh, Artemis with uh, Yes, yes, yes. yes. 
Uh, yeah, because in Java, it's just a simple for that. So yeah, yeah. We, we, we don't have to, um, and in this case, we even sort of have embedded Artemis, um, but but it's just the way of showing up. And you cannot use many other protocols like Stomp and everything that that's all supported, or Kafka or whatever you want to use. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's just a, that's just a way of showing Q basically, and I mean you could have done anything. Yeah. Is that on online or UI? So okay, so what I've shown now is command line. To show how, 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 that, how those things are working. Um, such a later will show you is for our rapid pro integration, um, something called Hot IO, uh, which is basically a little bit of a UI on top of this. And, and it works as a UI both for actually MQ Artemis and as a UI for Camel itself. So you can see the routes and everything. If you use the JAP file, then you can run this JAP. Yes, yes, okay. yes. yes. And for integrating any. Any data like your uh, data elements, then you can integrate with Spring Boot, all the property as in PHA. Well, you don't have to, right? So that, that was the particular sample. So you can just use it from SDK. Yeah. So, or, so. or posting also as SDK. This is also using the SDK. All this is, yeah. So, so this is again using the SDK and even uh, the SDK domain model. So this is all coming from the SDK. It, it, on this receiving side, this is all from the SDK. Yeah. So I think both have the same version. While you're integrating them, both have the same version. Of the same. So the same. Same version. You can it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. That, that's up to you. I mean, that's, uh, that, that does not have to be. Um, what you need to do is sometimes you need to know the version you're working with, right? But they might, if you go back to like 3.3, like a geometry would be very different from 2.9, for example. So you need to know this kind of stuff. But if you have a need to converge, this is the place where you would convert those kind of things, right? So you could create your own converter for it. Yeah. Because if you go back long enough, we had, um, so say for example, you had the, 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 the polygon as a, as, a, as a one column, and then they had an actual coordinate as a one column, but we have merged that into the geometry field, right? So you could potentially do that as part of the integration if that's something you need. Or understanding this for the when you convert the data data, how it is confirm that it's so related attributes changes or messages. Well you need to know. <laughs> I mean there's, there's no magic here, right? So so all, all, all of this this domain model is modeled after the version that it targets. So if the version you're coming from is not compatible, you will need you will need to take care of that. There, there's no magic here, at least not, not yet. Um, so, 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 yeah, so this is a target, yes. So again, we are reading from one side using the source, and then we are targeting the other side using the, the client target. Yeah. Again, I, I have you have to move on because uh, the time is going to be struggling if you don't. Um, I will show you the, um, the example. Um, yeah. this one. It's not big enough. I hope the people on the line can, can see this. Extremely laggy. I'm not even touching the. Let me try something. Okay, so well, what we're doing now, um, just want to show you. That's better. And then this one. So again, this is demo one and demo two. I hope people can see this. Uh, hear, to hear me. Um, so I just want to show you what's currently there. On the six units, you see there's only one old country. Oh, if it's <laughs> there it comes. And then on the other side. 
Um, because we're also using the same instance for, for another demo, I, I, I basically set up the same, same here. Um, so now we have So here we have set this in here. Yeah, so we have the same same organization that you will see in the in the while. Okay. And it has the same ERD. So in this case, right now they are all all distinct. Um, so let's start up our script. Okay, so now we are running the, the, the Spring Boot project. Um, all it's really doing is kind of building the, the file itself. Of course, you could have built a jar file. In this case, I'm not doing that. Um, then we will just wait for it to, to, to show up. Um, should I make it smaller again, maybe? That's not the one. So now it's up and running. Yeah, I think it's because more people are joining. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm sorry, we have about a 10 second delay here when we never do something on the screen, so I'm sorry for that. Um, anyways, so there's not much happening because obviously there is no difference, so there's nothing much for it to do. Um, so let's see, we can create now in demo one, you create a new one, you just call it. Like this, doesn't really matter. Um, right, so we're creating this one. This is a live demo, by the way, so I'm hoping this is still working. So now we have another one at level two. And it will, of course, we did it now. I think that hopefully I still have that 10 seconds. Yeah, you'll see now when the screen updates, you will see now in the demo two, we already have a book uh, available. Sorry, sorry for the delay. Um, yeah, that is switching now. As you will see here now, it's already there. So, the same way, if I want to go back here, I can go to for copy again. I can say uh, also. Right, so then we just go back here. Now we save it, call it also. Go back to demo here. And I was called also here also. I mean, it's, it's a simple example, but it's just so some, some of the things you can do using these kind of integration scripts. Uh, but this is something we're also going to focus a lot on going forward in the, in the, in the, in the integration team in general is to, to support these as to these as to integrations. So this kind of thing, of course, you will have to handle errors. What if the, what if the um, uh, server is down, what if you want to do partial tree synchronization, what if you don't have access to read right to that instance, there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, so this is a very simple example, but but it just shows you how it could be done using our SDK. And, and again, yeah. This feel like if we, uh, if we do all this overlay, this is just going to be the second argument just created by that second instance or? So right now, no, but that's because of something else, which I will get back to soon. So um, if that was the case, you would kind of have to over like, remove stuff. And that's a bit more complicated because we don't really have a good removal log in DHS2. So basically you just, if you remove say Oslo from instance one, 
All the script now will see is that oh, we have country, send country, but that exists. But it doesn't remove stuff. So we go back here. It's still here. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how, 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 how it sadly is. And, and in the same case, if I now remove country, now the series I would complain because all the actually wouldn't even complain because nothing will happen. Um, there's something called event hooks, which I'll talk about a bit later. I, I have to hurry up a bit, but, uh, but uh, I will show you something later that we have. This is doing this in a much more smarter way. Where, but if you're doing create, read, and deletes and updates, you can you get a notification and you can react to that notification basically, which is a lot better way of handling it. Um, because right now, as I said, when you delete something, it just it just gets gone from the that that uh, endpoint, but you don't know why or how it and like, who did it or not, not really much about that that information. I mean, that's up to you. And I mean, uh, right now this is metadata, um, but there's nothing stopping you from using the same approach with uh, aggregate data values or whatever you want to do, or enrollment, or yeah. yeah. But so, but but remember that again, this is a quite simple abstraction right now. So, and and when it comes to enrollments and tracker, there's going to be a lot of issues that you'll have to kind of take care of yourself. That's just how it is. I mean, it's it's going to be yeah. This how, how, in this case, like, how does the source uh, adapt to the or extend changes? So, in this case, it just pulls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it just pulls, pulls, it's just Um Hopefully, I mean, ideally, in the future, we will have, you can do from this just to, and then you just listen to event hooks, for example. That, that would be kind of the ideal yeah. thing. That, or, 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 or it's very easy in Camel to set up an HTTP server. So you just have like so you have um from um this server endpoint, whenever you get something to the server endpoint, like a push, you just start start it out. Yeah. This is kind of the much much better idea than doing it uh, going forward. Yeah, I think it'll build like camel adapters to run around with that good stuff. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we, we kind of have to, but we but we first we have to implement it. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's that's, all, that's all only in the <laughs> Okay, I, I do have another example, but I think I will skip it now just because of the time. Um, we will show you later when we talk about key clock. Uh, we also showed a little bit, we also have a bit of a key clock integration. Um, but we, we will show that as a demo when uh, Morton is talking about um, .NET Connect. Uh, other than that, are there any more questions before I move on? Again, the, the, the repository is linked from the slides, so you'll be able to, to get all these examples, and you can also ask me offline if you want. Uh, to, okay. It's all on GitHub. Yeah, all, all the examples today is on GitHub. Um, they, they are linked from their slides. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to talk about some of the other projects we've been doing. Um, let me just wait for the screen to update there. Some people online. That's it. Um, we also been working with WGL EMC to create um, an integration with uh, Richie Flow and Richie Base. Uh, so uh, as you probably know, uh, our packaging team in Oslo, they have been busy creating all these packages for different uh, WHL standards. And, and, and what, well, one of them is for the uh, AFI, which is the adverse event reporting. So um, if you get a COVID vaccine and you have, a, you know, you have a bad effect, bad reaction to that, uh, that's usually reported in, in a global system called Richie Flow. Um, uh, and that ends up in another system called Bitchy Base. Um, and, and now we, we have created a small script for that um, that basically allows you to have automate that process. Um, it does not currently support API integration. That's quite difficult with Bitchy uh, right now. Um, hopefully, in the future, you'll be able to do that. Um, we also want them generally to double check what's coming out. That's kind of what we've been told. So that, that's what's happening right now. But we can schedule a weekly email or a daily email or so on um, to, um, <clears throat> to basically any kind of inbox. Uh, then you'll just get a list of XML with all the new cases. Then you could import that into um, uh, Richie Flow. And we also have an API for it where you can just also go and this just last up to the parameter you say, give me all, all from yesterday or whatever you want. So yeah, so that's one of the things we've been working on. The current multiple countries trying starting this up. 
um, and also just work with Maldives, but there's also Laos, there's also Solomon Island, we hope to, to put it into, and a few other countries in Africa. So um, it's being used more and more. Um, yeah. I will switch over now to Shatra. So I will stop sharing my screen. Want to? Uh, hello, everyone. So, I will quickly go to uh, one of the uh, use cases that we have addressed using uh, canal components and the Java SDK. So, I will try to quickly go through uh, this one because uh, I think Morton has more interesting stuff and surprises for us uh, upcoming next. Um, so, Morton demoed uh, one of the use cases where we integrated DHIS with DHIS2. But in this case, uh, we have DHIS2 on one side, and then we have something called Rapid Pro on the other side. But this is going to be the uh, structure in most of the integration cases. So we have two, uh, two or more systems, and uh, all, all these systems know how to uh, talk in some kind of a data representation language, which is uh, JSON in this case. And also, they know how to uh, use some kind of a transport. So in this case, uh, uh, DHS2 uses HTTP, and uh, luckily, uh, Rapid Pro also uses HTTP, so which makes uh, things much simpler. And in, in between, uh, when, when trying to integrate, integrate these two components, we have uh, one of our uh, uh, plugin that we have developed using the uh, DHS2 uh, kernel components. And then we have also used uh, something called Data Sonnet, which is kind of like a a uh, scripting language which supports uh, uh, transforming payload from one format to another. So in this case, it's JSON to JSON. And I mean, we can even use data center to transform from XML to JSON or JSON to XML. So those kind of things are supported by data center. So when it comes to Rapid Pro, I think uh, almost all of you have uh, seen uh, uh, reality TV programs where you are expected to you know, vote for the participants. Uh, so you can simply uh, SMS with some kind of a code and then uh, the participants uh, ID or something. So the system automatically captures that vote and uh, you know increase the number of votes for uh, for the participants. So that is kind of like the uh, most basic thing that can be implemented with Rapid Pro. So instead of Rapid, uh, instead of uh, um, handling such a basic thing, Rapid Pro. Uh, uh, provides us the ability to create uh, messaging flows, uh, which are more complex and which kind of, uh, you know, presents with questions for use uh, for users. Uh, and then uh, when the when the user sends us with the response, it also automatically captures that response, and then it can decide to present users with more questions or end the flow and create one. Uh, large payload which includes all the responses from the user so for instance uh, if we if we uh, get get a simple example so uh, i mean if you take this event itself we can create a rapid pro flow to capture uh, the number of participants from each list so in this uh, i mean a user can initiate that flow with uh, some kind of a code maybe uh, his asia's uh, it, it can be anything. So once once user send the correct SMS, the rapid pro rapid pro rapid pro initiates a, a message flow, and it can start asking questions. So it can first ask how many users from his Vietnam, and then the user can respond with let's say ten or something, and then rapid pro registers that in the uh, messaging workflow. Uh, I mean it can be like uh, his Vietnam ten or uh, something like that. So it, it is basically building a JSON structure, including all the responses from the user, and then once that response is recorded and if that is a valid response rapid, rapid pro will move on to the next question and ask uh, how many uh, uh, participants from his India so something like that so it can uh, go on like that until the flow is completed and at the end of the flow uh, rapid pro saves that response as a single json object or even uh, uh, i mean we can configure rapid pro to uh, call an external web hook um, so in the in the rapid pro to DHIS to integration, what we mainly want to do is capture some 
community level uh, uh, aggregated data from uh, Rapid Pro users and then uh, send them over to DHIS2 in the form of data value sets. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, as you already know, uh, the data value sets needs to have uh, some kind of uh, an organization unit binding. So uh, for that, we need to know uh, which user is sending uh, these uh, requests to Rapid Pro and as well as uh, the organization unit where that user belongs to. So that's uh, so in order to facilitate that, the, uh, the first functional requirement that we have identified is uh, synchronizing users. Uh, so what happens here is uh, uh, our integration component uh, first fetch uh, uh, users with valid phone numbers from DHIS2. So it's going to get that as a JSON payload as uh, we have previously seen. And then it's going to transform uh, that JSON payload into a format uh, where Rapid Pro understands as a Rapid Pro uh, uh, contact. So in, in, in DHS2, we have uh, DHS2 users, and in Rapid Pro, we have Rapid Pro contacts. So it's basically uh, doing this transformation from DHS2 users to Rapid Pro contacts, and it's, it also includes uh, DHS2 organization unit ID as an additional parameter. Uh, in the Rapid Pro contact. So when, when we receive a message, uh, I mean, Rapid Pro identifies users uh, uh, based on the phone number. So now when the message is received, Rapid Pro knows uh, which user from DH, DHIS2 has sent this message, as well as the DHIS2 organization unit that belongs to that user. Uh, and um, I will come back to broadcast rem uh, reminders later. Uh, and the next functional requirement is, I mean, this is the main requirement of the entire um, um, integration. That is, that is to transfer reports uh, from the Rapid Pro users or Rapid Pro contacts uh, directly to the DHIS2 system. So when a Rapid Pro contact sends us a message, uh, it, Rapid Pro first going to, uh, you know, walk that uh, user through that uh, messaging flow and capture all the uh, information that needs to be captured from the user, and it's going to create uh, one uh, large data set, uh, which includes all the responses from the user. And then, uh, if we have configured Rapid Pro to call a webhook, I mean, we have two approaches for uh, doing this. Either we can configure a webhook uh, so that it will call uh, one of the webhooks that we have exposed through our integration component, and then it will transfer uh, all the information as we, as Rapid Pro gets them uh, in real time. Or we have a, another approach where the integration component can call periodically Rapid Pro, uh, Rapid Pro with the flow ID and the uh, some kind of timestamp so that it will get all the new events that uh, appears after after the timestamp uh, time stamp specified. And once it once our integration component receives some kind of a message uh, or a, or an event from Rapid Pro, then it can call back Rapid Pro and say uh, ask Rapid Pro for the uh, information about uh, the user that has sent this message. For instance, uh, our integration component now has all the data uh, to fill in the data value set, but it does not know the organization unit. So it can again go back to Rapid Pro and ask for the organization unit uh, where the where this user belongs to and then finally it can uh, you know create the entire payload that should be sent over to the data value sets api and simply call uh, dhis to uh, data value sets api through the uh, dhis to camera components and then we have broadcast reminders uh, which is also a functional requirement uh, so if, if if a data value set is kind of like um, expiring, then uh, the integration component can, you know, periodically check for the expiring data value sets and remind the users uh, about, uh, you know, remind the users to enter data if, if they are behind the schedule. Uh, and there are some uh, non-functional requirements for this integration as well. So the first one, first and the most important one is uh, reliability. So that means if uh, Rapid Pro registers a message from a user, and if, if, if the user com uh, completes the flow without any errors, then we should guarantee that it's going to be uh, delivered to the uh, DHIS2 instance and uh, you know create the data set and uh, complete it. And then uh, some of the common non-functional requirements are uh, security and maintainability, and also uh, the uh, integration uh, solution should be fast enough because uh, now we have discussed only about 
uh, use case where one user sends an SMS, but uh, in production environment, there can be hundreds or thousands of users sending uh, concurrent SMSs and uh, dealing with multiple concurrent flows. So uh, all these accepted messages should, should be uh, timely delivered with an accept, acceptable queue and uh, low latency. And the, uh, the last uh, non-functional requirement that we have identified is extensibility. Uh, so this was useful in uh, Uganda case. Uh, so by the way, this has been uh, successfully deployed in Uganda. So uh, in their requirement, there's another component in between uh, um, our integration component and DHIS2. So they have uh, a, a, another homegrown solution uh, which accepts messages from the from our integration solution. And then that that shows uh, that solution kind of do some kind of auditing and stuff, and then then only uh, delivers those messages to DHS to see. So extensibility is important, so we can easily uh, you know uh, switch components. So if, if if we don't want to submit uh, messages directly to DHS to, we, we should be able to simply change uh, some of the uh, available um, codes and uh, deliver that message to something else. And apart from that, we are also providing uh, management and uh, monitoring tools and also uh, tools for recovery. Uh, so we are using how uh, how for management and monitoring, which is kind of a, a JMX based uh, tool, which is natively supported by Camel as well. Uh, so with this tool, we can stop and close routes uh, if that is required. So if there's some kind of maintenance going on, we can simply close uh, some of the route. So we don't, we will not, uh, we will kind of Stop accepting messages on that route uh, temporarily, and also we can view the failures. So, if 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 there's uh, if Rapid Pro has successfully accepted the message, but it, if it has failed when delivering that to DHS too, uh, so we can uh, simply uh, view those failures and uh, you know manually address them if that if that is possible. And also uh, throughout the uh, Camel routes, we can uh, you know add. Uh, info logs or debug logs or logs at any level, and uh, this uh, how how IO is capable of uh, you know getting those logs registered and uh, provide an interface uh, a nice interface to view the, those logs later, um, and also it provides uh, the ability to analyze latency so we can see uh, which route route takes more time. Or, I mean, if 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 a route is taking uh, a significant amount of uh, time we can uh, you know easily debug why it's happening and things like that and also we have ht for uh, h2 database for recovery so what i mean it, it, we kind of use that as the data channel so if something fails we uh, simply save the entire payload into h2 uh, database so it can be later analyzed and repost manually if that is required uh, and also it acts as a uh, uh, repository for logs and uh, it can be used for because it registers which uh, rapid pro user sent, sent, sent a message and uh, whether it's, it was delivered and all those things so it can be easily used for debugging as well uh, sorry auditing yeah that's about it Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we are not actually sending uh, any uh, events to DHIS2 with the same user. We are using we are using uh, some kind of a common user for sending all the events. We uh, we use user just to identify the uh, organization. Okay. Uh, and the episode is like uh, also, no, we don't have to code anything. Uh, I mean, there's an option to code as well if that is required. I mean, if, if there's some kind of a custom logic that is hard to implement, we can code it. But it provides a, a user interface where you can drag and drop components and configure them to use it. Yeah, it's like a dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Normalism. Yeah, uh, Rapid Pro supports uh, Facebook messages, WhatsApp messages, and all those things. So we can integrate them as well. Yes. Okay.
It's available on uh, DHIS to GitHub. Yeah, yeah uh, go to the G DHIS to GitHub and if you type rapid pro, uh, then that's the link. I think I'm looking here. So let's go. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's continue. Uh, we don't have that much time now, so I will try to be with uh, with the last thoughts. Um, just a little bit about our kind of approach to fire going forward. Um, as you probably know, we tried at some point created this kind of be all and all uh, fire to this to adapter, this to to fire adapter, um, two ways um, thinking. Um, it didn't really go that well. I mean, it it, it is being used, um, but it was never deployed anywhere by us or by Oslo team itself. Um, so we kind of switched kind of focus a little bit when it comes to fire and we kind of trying to support specific use cases. Um, so again, we are using the same stack as we just have gone through the Rapid Pro with the, the example of the organ sync and everything. And so going forward, we will be very much more specific when it comes to this as to fire integrations. That might be synchronizing your locations and your organizations, might be synchronizing your code base or code systems and analysis sets and so on. Uh, so, so there's a little bit just very quickly about that kind of how, how, how that approach is. We do have some examples already that is, 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 is in one of the, the linked repositories. So, so feel free to kind of look into that if, if there's something that interests you. Um, we have been working also a little bit with uh, Paho. Um, just doing a little bit of this kind of push day response stuff, um, which basically maps to these two uh, events. So uh, that allows us to, well, hopefully in the future, we'll allow us to both send and receive these kind of events as push days, basically. Um, and again, there's an example there that you can have a look at. Um, we have had a couple of other conferences. Um, one of them was the, the, the annual conference in the, in the summer. Again, there's three, four examples there using uh, the SDK, using data sonnet, and a few other things to create uh, bundles. So MCSD is basically a profile, file profile for uh, organization units, well, simple as that. And, and it's basically showing the four ways of implementing that using our SDK. Uh, some of them using data sonnet, some of them are not. So um, please have a look at that. Um, and, and, and that's a public um, repository. Um, and all the examples from today will be on this, is on, well, it's currently private, but will be made public soon. So please go there if you have to look at any of the demos I've shown you today. And there's also the key club demo that will be shown, shown soon. And we do have a new website, which is probably the most important part of this new fire strategy. Um, feel free to go there. Stop this one. Let's stop sharing my screen now. We have this new fancy website. Well, it's not a new website, but it's a new new page on our um, on the digitalization2.org. And it kind of goes through a little bit about our standing on, on, the, on fire going forward and um, the, the tech technologies, the profile we're targeting. Um, and so on. So please, have, I'm not going to go through all, the, all this time, of course. There is also a link to uh, the presentation we did in the summer, uh, which again is showing a lot of the same stuff I'm showing you today. So, so please have a look at that if that's interesting. It goes, goes a little bit more in details regarding how this fire stuff has been, been used. Um, and if you go all the way down, you will also see some links to, to, to more examples um, that we have made. So this is probably kind of the Deep place to go if you want to know anything about fire and issues too. We'll be updating this going forward so whenever there's a new um, project we'll be doing using fire, um, they will be added here. And then whenever there's a new presentation, it will also be added here. And and um, so yeah, so so please have a look at that. That's just up now a couple of days ago. So this is kind of fresh. Okay, so a little bit about what's happening for the future with the um, the integration team, what, what our plan is. So as I said, um, kind of switching gears a little bit and, and doing something that we probably should have done a lot to start with is that we're going to focus a lot on 
Uh, these are two to these are three integrations. Specifically, as I showed you, the organic sync stuff, um, that's gonna be kind of made into a pro product itself, something you can just download and you can implement on your server. You potentially have a source and then multiple targets that you want to synchronize with. Potentially some parameters, depending on if you want to do synchronize the full tree, partial, or what you want to actually synchronize. And of course, you don't necessarily just want to organize, you want to organize groups, the group sets, you might have attributes on it. So uh, it's a bit more complicated than what I've shown you today. It's a, of course, it's a lot more involved than just synchronizing some small parts of the organics. We want to expand that uh, maybe specifically to option sets, um, categories, category options potentially, and, and kind of build on that until we have again uh, a kind of a, more of a full fledged product. But this is again a long term plan, it's not, uh, not even a six month, it's six months a year, uh, and also going forward in general. Um, but potentially, there might be data integration there also happening. Uh, again, focus on this, uh, the whole fire rate makes sense. If you have a real fire need in your country, not because you just some donor is telling you you need fire, but if you have an actual system with fire, you want these two to work with that, to make integration happen, we are very, very happy to support with that. And the email was in the start of, of, the, of the slide, so you can please send us an email. Again, please have a system <laughs> with fire already, because there's a lot of uh, people coming to us, they just want fire and they don't know the profile they're targeting. They don't have a fire system in place. They don't have anything. So again, we want to support real world use cases. So if you have something, please, please come to us with that. Uh, another thing that's more and more important is that working with VCS2 core itself, uh, I'm also part of the platform team, <clears throat> supporting instance accessibility in VCS2. Uh, as I said, Event Hooks is the first up upcoming that will be there in 240. Uh, well, the initial version will be then 240. API gateways is another one, <clears throat> allowing you to call out to other systems uh, without having to uh, use some cores or anything like that. But you can have a, a properly set up authentication happening with encrypted passwords and so on. So you just go to API, you know, API gateways X, and then you go to another server and you get the data, and then that's how you do that. Um, Another way we want to really want to influence this as too is system identifiers and how that's working currently. It's not great, to say the least. We have the code field, single code. You don't know what the code represents. Um, we want to expand on that. We want to maybe more a little bit on fire, but there are many also, also other identifier systems out there. We want to kind of look into how we can do that in a the, in the better way. And of course, code lists in general. Um, again, this has two option sets. They get the job done, but they're not great, right? They, they, again, you're kind of missing the context, you're missing reusability, uh, on, on those kind of things. So um, that's something we also want to work with, with the team on. Mm. And maybe the bigger thing is there will be an integration academy in March. Um, the dates, as the exact dates will be announced soon. Um, this is probably happening in, in Rwanda um, in, in March, mid-March or something, or end, end of March. Uh, but again, um, the dates will be announced um, in your usual, your usual places. Okay, and you, so I have about, I, I will reduce five more minutes and then I will hand it over to more people to open ID for next stuff. Um, again, I just want to tell you that the open of event hook stuff is a much more interesting way of doing the organizing I showed you today. Um, we're going to focus on web hooks to start with. So something happening in ESH2, for example, you get new organets, you will support the target being webhook, but in the future, the target can be Kafka, it can be actually MQ, it can be anything that you want to support, basically. And, and that's kind of the, the idea here that we, we, we're not tying the, the source to the, to the target. We, 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 we will support multiple things here. Um, but again, for 240, it's going to be metadata and, and probably only webhooks. Uh, we will see what we have time for, of course. And another thing is that we have this internal Artemis queue being used for all this and so on. And this is not meant as a direct replacement, but it might potentially be in the future that we can, we can kind of reuse this kind of event scripts for the same things. And I'm, I'm hoping for it. So I have a very experimental demo. I just want to show you how it's going to work. Um, hopefully, hopefully it will work. <laughs> this is again a live demo. so. Um, yeah, I have a very simple, this is, uh, this is nothing that's publicized yet, by the way. So this is uh, not something you can test out yourself right now, but 
I'm just running a very simple um, um, instance of JSON tree locally. Um, it has CLE on database, so it's nothing special. Um, if you go to the webhooks endpoint, you will see it currently has no webhooks at all. So nothing special there. Um, of course, it's usually start with no webhooks. So let's create the webhook. <clears throat> so in this case, again, oh, this is still very small. Uh, so So again, you see this uh, yes, of course, the name. It has a in this case a setting stable uh, and the UID, which is always recommended. Um, the path in this case is just metadata. Um, you will see that the actual path for this this is going to happen will be metadata dot organization unit dot the UID of the object being affected. But you could just listen to all metadata using this. There will be much more options here, including field filtering and so on. But right now. All you can say is give it this path, I will listen to this path only. And you can have targets. In this case, I uh, only have one target, but you can actually have multiple targets. So if I told the target multiple instances, or you want to do one webhook and one Kafka and one something else, um, that should be all be supported. Uh, so you just set the type, in this case, of course, webhook. Uh, I, will ha I have another gateway, I will show you soon uh, how that works. And in this type, I'm using uh, API token. So this is not just a true API token, by the way. This is something that's implemented on the receiving side. So this allows you to do, like if, if, this, if the, the, the gateway itself needs some kind of authentication, uh, we support HTTP basic and API token for that. So you can just enter that here, or you just switch out type API token to type HTTP basic, and then it will automatically um, assume you mean um, basic authentication, and then you have a username password as your field as your fields. Okay, so let me just send that to the system. Hopefully it's okay. Yep, okay, one web hook created. I have to go back. We'll see we have the web hook. Right, so we have the stuff here. Right now, um, the tokens and so on are not encrypted. They, they will be in the future. Again, it's, it's, it's a starting point. Um, you can also set stuff like custom headers. If you have other stuff you want to do, Maybe the authentication is not using the right headers, so you want to set up your own X API token or whatever the might be. So you can add whatever headers you want to that request. Okay, so let's see here now. Let me start up the other demo. So I have created a small little project here. As I said, this is uh, so this is using Spring Boot Tree and Spring Framework Six and then JDK Seventeen. Um, Nothing other than that, nothing special. I'm just receiving uh, the webhook request, getting the payload, um, and pulling out the authorization header from that. Then I'm double checking again here. We have a hard coded API token, just checking that it equals, if not 401, not authorized. And then we're just printing out basically what, what we receive. Um, so, what makes it interesting, as again, a little bit, I uh, call it the future, <laughs> maybe not the best name. Um, but you can actually run this as a binary. So one of the things is very cool about this new version of, of Spring coming out is that you can actually build um, the project as a binary. So in this case, I can I can run this up. Um, I don't even need to have Java installed in this case. I mean, it's a full binary that contains everything you want. And this allows you to push that into a Docker or a real pack, whatever you want, a very extremely lightweight container. Okay, so it's up and running. So let's see if we, as I say, this, this started up now in say, for one second. Just to compare, if I'm starting up. <clears throat> So you start up with normal Spring Boot. Oh, this is one, sorry. Just as a comparison, because this is something that's very interesting. And sadly, Camel did not support Spring Boot 3 yet. 
Um, but it will in the future. It doesn't take much longer in this case. It's just 1.1 second. But if you can see the, it is, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a lot quicker, right? So, it's, it's, so the, the native just starts up immediately. Um, but again, let's just use the native one. Um, okay. So let's go back to my postman. Let's close this down. And let's create a new organet. Very straightforward. Um, even though this is early on, I'm, I'm not adding any parent, I think I'm just doing it simple. So you're going to end up with two roots, but it doesn't really matter for this, this test case. So I'm sending this in. Okay. Two of all created. Perfect. Now if I go back, go back to my um, listener, you'll see. Well, it was not 401, so the authentication was correct. <coughs> you see the actual path is metadata organization unit dot the UID. Uh, in this case, again, this is a just a work in progress that, that, that how this will look is will be different, but it's going to have the same op operation that was supposed to create operation. And then we have the full payload. Again, we probably don't want the full payload, so there will be field tilting support and so on. And so again, we go back to Postman. You can do a little bit of an update. Let's just call it, I don't know, call it the country two percent. Doesn't really matter. And again, we're sending it in. Again, it was a 200 OK. Now, another one is, is sent. Again, same path because it's the same object with the element. And now the op is update. And now, maybe the most important thing, we should not really. Sorry. <laughs> And maybe now the most important thing, which is something we really don't support well in this is too, is deletions. So now I'm going to delete the organet I created. Again, 200 OK. This time you will not get the full payout, but it will say, OK, this is again the path. The operation this time is delete. And this, the object is just the idea of the object. So using this now, I can actually react to deletions of organization in this initial too. If you have them synchronizing with an external service, it's not always as easy as doing that because obviously, uh, if you have a long running system like that, you might have data linked to it and so on. But again, that goes back to the complexities of organizing. But again, now at least we have the option of reacting to deletions. We have options to actually react to the deletions of, of our organization. Yes. Yeah, this is just a quick demo. I have to switch over to more mess. Um, is there any questions with this before, before you continue? Thank you. I think they will just uh, move on. Hello. <laughs> okay, so I will hand it over to Martin. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I'm just going to briefly talk about OpenID Connect and then we will do a demo, which I'll have a camera. So yeah, OpenID Connect is a, is a provider agnostic single sign-on solution. It works with the uh, yeah, as such as multiple things that can share a central business service. So mm -hmm. one way of saying it. Um, so this is basically what we're going to demo right today. So uh, it can also be used in uh, like single instance uh, that business. So well, so. I don't know if you know about OpenID Connect and uh, what we do, but it's a, it's a very common solution now for, for uh, at least today. Um, so, we're probably seeing like logging with Google and logging with Facebook and uh, stuff like that. That's often that's OpenID Connect. Um, so, it's often used in countries that uh, already has a national education and digital, digital education system where the government typically has a server and a like, organization that kind of takes care of uh, providing that uh, service. So, for example, like uh, KS in Norway, when they implemented a COVID vaccine uh, uh, system, they, they were using OpenID Connect with uh, their existing uh, government uh, solution that was OpenID Connect compatible. So, also, that person in Norway would be missing. So, yeah, that's been supported since 2005. 
uh, uh, I think Kenneth was the first that actually uh, did things. So it's been a production for a while now. It's very easy to set up. Uh, uh, it requires minimal configuration. In, uh, so yeah, we can demo that, that now. So yeah, and we also support uh, the test and web tokens, uh, which uh, is the uh, Android client actually supports uh, login with uh, right now. So there's the uh, challenges to this. Yeah, we can go back. So yeah, the challenges that typically uh, yeah emerges is that uh, uh, you have to uh, do all the role management and utilization uh, of uh, this data by uh, the DHS server. So, yeah, that, that's kind of a challenge uh, in uh, this uh, central application system. So, so for example, yeah, the FRK case, it was the, like, there are many customs uh, solutions to kind of enable there to kind of solve this problem to have like a central uh, system that. Also, administers the which roles and uh, these should have. Because of that, you connect only does authentication. There's no authorization, there's no role management or anything like that. It's a purely authentication uh, as solution. Uh, so, yeah, so we're looking into that now uh, to maybe have some kind of uh, visual. Uh, Middleware tools that people that want to use this can can kind of uh, start using. So one yeah one challenge also you can see the demo there uh, when you're logging out on multiple instances there's no automatic kind of synchronization uh, with the sessions from the all the other instances so that can be just relying on the session time. So yeah. There's some leaks there. Let me see some examples. Um, and did more about. So yeah, we're gonna do a quick demo now. Um, should I come over to you? Yeah, see, that's you can also create others as well. Um, if you use something like Gito, you're not just limited to DHS2, right? Because it's set up other systems. Um, so if you have existing systems in your in your country, um, I don't know what you have, but like logistics system or in your source or CMS, whatever, then you can potentially also create a DSO across uh, many different systems. Yep. So the yeah, open can connect to some very some industry standards like uh, everybody's using that now. And, doesn't look like it's going to stop the population quite a while. So, right, so now this is uh, just going to quickly show you the configuration examples of how to, to set up the configuration in, uh, in the HSS server. So, basically, we have um, in this case three P, P configured. Um, demos of DHS2. Um, they all look the same, so we're just going to show you one of them. Yeah. So we're just going to show you one of them. They're basically the same. There's a little bit of uh, small, small changes to all of them. Um, I will let Martin talk, but that's basically all. So we're just going to show you one now, and, and, and we can talk about that. Yeah, just going to show you quickly the, the, like the, an example of how it can be configured. So. Uh, you can you can actually have multiple uh, OpenID Connect providers also. Um, so on the front page of the DHS server, you can actually have like one button logging with Keycloak and one button logging with Google. Uh, so it's not like 
yeah, it came from one uh, at the same time. So, yeah, so this is like the minimum of the connect uh, uh, part. So, this is the client ID and the client secret. That's, that's like the uh, and the redirect URL. That's the three most important uh, information. So, this is this one is more just yeah, pointing to the Kiplog server. Uh, but this, all these URLs are actually the, um, standardized in the way that every provider actually provide, provides them with, uh, from uh, URL. So you can do like this dynamic uh, registration with this uh, um, configuration. We don't support that right now, but we might do that in the future. So yeah, that, that's the minimum setup. Um, yeah, I'm not going to show you exactly how the key clock. Uh, the key clock is very easy to start with, just download it, start it up in like, like a demo. Uh, yeah, we're going to put up some uh, bytes on the on website. So, do that. Uh, so we have a uh, key clock running here. So, yeah, I'm just going to add a user, test user. Yeah, Yeah, so that, that's it. So here, the email is going to be the what's called the mapping game. So we, we, you're going to have a user in the DHS server that has uh, mapped this uh, email as the mapping value. So that's that's it. There's no no role management done. This is just uh, minimum setup. So yeah, now we see this uh, sign in key clock. So this comes from the, from the configuration I just showed you, then automatically be generated from, from that config. So, so yeah, there's more providers, you just comments on you. Uh, so now I'm gonna click, click on uh, sign in with the uh, key clock. <laughs> right. It's a password. Is that password? So, still the account to have a password in your hand. So, yeah, Kicklock supports like when you're provisioning like a user, you can send an email and then change the, the password the first time. That's one of the ways to do the uh, user provisioning and stuff. Now we're just gonna hard, hard call it. So that's it. I'm logging out. So now I can go to the other instance. Yeah, I, I, I did every log out at all there, but uh, yeah, so now I'm gonna automatically get logged in there without going to the to the um, to the login screen from the So this this is like uh, the thing. So the sessions are not automatically synchronized there, but but they're already logged into Keep to. Send it directly So that's the
Assure is supported. Yes. That's all that's supported. Assure is supported. Looks negative. So, so again, again, the, the bigger issue is synchronization of your users. This is the biggest problem. Yes. Yeah. yeah. For that, we have created the email ID and then the user user ID. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that 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 that's important. That's important. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we are working on a little bit of tooling around TikTok and this just too. I will show you very, very simple. This is the last thing I'm going to do today. I'm just going to go back to what Martin did here and I'm going to delete it. Because I don't, I don't want to do this manually in this morning. So I just delete. So now it's gone again. So if you go back to the instance here, um, log out. All this bad data because it's good. I guess because the, the session is uh, not perfect. That's why. So, so I'm just going to show you that in demo three we have. So now in click left, there is no test user, but of course, to, the reason this even worked was that we had this user in all three instances. And, and that's one problem just to, to, to handle. It's the DCS to DCS2 user synchronization. But now you have to have key block. And now you have another place you only have to add the same users. So that's something we want to help you a little bit with. So um, see, we had three users here. But in this case, they are just using passwords, right? So they're not using the external authentication. At all, but we do have one user called test user, same as Morton just created. It has this one clicked, the external of only flag. So, what we really want to do ideally now, we want to just take a look at this server and put this test user inside of KCloud automatically. Um, and for that, we have again, this is very much work in progress. Um, you will require a few tokens as well, um, but again. As Morton said, there will be uh, this one right up of this at some point, how to do the cloud edition to integration. Um, but I just want to show you now uh, we are using uh, the user integration, this integration at Tisha 2, and we are just pulling directly from um, the demo tree. Again, we're going to use the SDK and the camera component as we saw before. We have to have a place of target. So this is the key cloud we're targeting. And then we have the token that, that we have. And, and again, we, this is something that we can probably write up at some point, but it's, it's pretty straightforward to get your API token to make this work. But you do need an API token. If not, you, you will get access to my of course. So again, this, this model is quite similar to what we had before with the organizing. So again, this time, of course, the, the big change here is, oh, I'll make it bigger again, sorry. In this case, I'm just doing it once. Again, you can do this every night, whatever timing you want to do. Um, I make sure that external of is uh, true because those are the, in my case, those are the only really the one I want to care about. Your, your, your case might be different. Um, you do what you want to do. You might have other filters you want to apply to it, the user filtering and so on. And uh, what you only, only really care about is the ID, which in this case is not being used actually, but in future, it might be nice to have the UID also in, in the cloud. The username, of course, is important. The email, and then if it's disabled or not. So if the user gets disabled, then then will just stop allowing logging with that. And in this case, we're just pulling directly from the user's endpoints. Again, we're doing the unmatched learning, exactly as before, splitting as we did before, and then we're sending one-on-one -on -one user updates over the wire by using Artemis. Then on the receiving end, so it's usually the most interesting and um, pretty much as before, um, we're unmasking that back into user class. In this case, since KeyClock has a different domain that is just two, I have created some uh, Lombok classes to model exactly what's required for, for KeyClock. Um, again, the demo will be available. Uh, you'll see here, it looks a bit different from this just two, um, the way it handles. Um, for example, credentials and so on, passwords and so on, it's a bit different than the issue too, but that's fine. So that's why we have to transform it. 
again, one of the big issues you're going to see is passwords. It's just you does not expose your password. That's a good, good thing. But it does require a credential on, on the receiving side. So if we had maybe maybe in this case we should try to set up email so they, they would usually have to use email to verify the first time they log in. We did not, so we're just setting a static password. We do add an action, which means that the first time they log in, they will have to change the password. So, so they have to change it immediately. So you can kind of email them the some generated password and saying, okay, please log in with this one, but then you have to change. And of course, if it is just enabled or not. And again, we're setting the body. This is a new body that Camel care about. Um, in this case, since we are not targeting DHS2, we cannot use DHS2 as, the, as the, 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 the receiving property. But the good thing about the Camel, it has components for all kinds of things, including many different HTTP clients. So we are setting the method to be a post because we are posting something to the endpoint. Uh, the authorization is using the Abira token. So we're just putting down the token we had in the, in the properties file. This is how to be authenticated. The content type is what we're setting because we're setting JSON. And this is the endpoint we're setting to, which is the um, slash users. And then we just uh, end up logging out the result. This is the null. Just fine. Um, and I'm not sure if I have it open here already. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, good. So again, you can see that we don't have a user in Kickstarter, um, but we just run it out Spring Boot. Um, and again, it will only run once because that's my, my, my timer I set up in on it. So when it's starting up, I feel well, you should see something. Hopefully the token hasn't expired. It might have. Yeah, for one. So, sorry, the, the, the talk has expired, so that happens. And then we set some five highlights. Sorry for that. So hopefully now it should be working. Um, unless we have changed something else in the server. I don't think we have, but uh, <laughs> let's see. This is the demo. The, the, the end result is that we should have the user. So if that doesn't happen, just know that the actual works. Um, <laughs> okay. Right user to click log. If this time it was successful, you go back to your click log. You can refresh. Now uh, we have the test user. Right, so now we have the test user here. If you go into here, you will see it has some credentials um, and so on. So, yeah, nothing too, too exciting, but at least it worked. And now we can go back to one of our instances of DHS2. We make sure we have that. We already logged that. Um, okay. So, we allow that, and then we should be able to. Sign in with key log. Okay, now uh, we, we set this static pass password, remember? So let's just copy that so we have that one. And we go back in here now. Password and this test user. And also remember that if we set an action, so what happens now, you need to change the password to activate your account. Okay, let me change the password to. Something very secure, like hello. <laughs> and now we are logged in again using this one. So the next time we go out here, um, log in here, then And then let's put a different um, instance. So this is demo four again, and let's just verify that it's still working. 
and it's working fine. So now you kind of get the same result. It's just this time it was a little bit more automated that you get the key club user automatically created for you. It's not written, which is Sorry? It's not written, token ID or secret ID. Like no, no, that's that's a different. Uh, so this is a camel project. This is this is the integration project. So this is not a new just two users. This is just a way of synchronizing the users. Again, using the SDK. Yeah. And this demo will also be available in the same repository if you want to have a look. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm also going to write some tutorials. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a few steps involved when it comes to actual integration because you have to get the token and to create admin users, you have to set up some authorities and so on. Uh, so, so we will, we'll, there will be some guides around that. Yeah. You all, you, you, have, you can still, it's okay, so you can have a mix. Some users can use using password, and some can use in click club. So, so we have a mix, so you're still allowed to have a, 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 You just say that already logging into block, then pipes, again, readers, you're ready password to DHS for DHS. So you're already logging into block. Yeah, that's why, that's why when the click button is just, is it's just forward directed to DHS too. It will verify with Kiklo that you're logged in already, and then there's no login. in. So this is in the demo four now. You didn't have to actually go in and do anything, right? You, you all you only did was to click on the corner button, but you still have to click on the button. So, so the, there's, there's no automatic that if you, if you got the instance, you already logged in. When you click on the yeah. button, then you already logged in. Okay, so not provided yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. It, it's just because it auto filled it. That's why you look like the user password. But what I did just click on the button. Uh, the user password is the case was not not used at all. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. Um, we're a bit over time. Um, sorry for that. Um, are there any kind of final questions before we end? If not, I think we are okay for today. Just um, a quick couple yeah. of points. Uh, okay. Firstly, big hand to Morton and Morton and uh, Chatter as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> And um, if anyone uh, online or watching this back later has got any questions for any of you, what's the best way to kind of get in touch? Um, integration at digital2.org is probably easiest. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I think we've got lunch now and uh, we'll be back in 50 minutes.